All right, good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, dealing with a little bit of unexpected technical difficulties, but nevertheless, we're figuring out a way to make this happen. Um, it is the second Wednesday of the month, so you know it's time for Read, Watch, Listen. Normally, this is a very special day of the month, but it's even extra special. We've got some extra special guests from the Parks and Rec Department, a handful of friends from over there. In case you did not know, which I didn't until a few months ago, uh, July is Park and Rec month. So I'd like to wish the staff that are on the call right now a happy July. If you're out there and you enjoy parks like I do, happy July to you as well. Um, before we hop in, I do want to give a very, very basic overview of parks history. I got this right from the website, uh, but this is a really nice little tidbit. It kind of gives you an overview of how the parks developed. And, uh, you know, we're really fortunate here in Palm Beach County to have so, so many green spaces and beach facilities and pools and things like that. There's a lot of stuff out there that I'm still learning about as I'm digging through. Um, I'm, I'm sure you, you could spend a lifetime exploring and having fun with so many of the amenities and facilities around. So before we jump in, you know, the Palm Beach County Parks Department was created in 1951 under the direction of the County Engineer's Office. And then by 1965, the department had 12 parks and a workforce of 69 employees. In 1972, there was some county reorganization and the, the department moved from in, being under, under, under engineering to its own Parks and Rec Department entity. Uh, steadily expanded throughout the 60s and 70s. And of course, we all know there's a huge population boom in South Florida in the 80s and 90s. Along with that boom came uh, increased demand for leisure services, recreational opportunities. So that went hand in hand with some expansion efforts among parks. And today that leaves us with 104 park properties in the county, uh, spanning over 8,500 acres and 85 developed regional district, community beach and neighborhood parks. We have a handful of people, as I said, on the call today, whose day-to-day -day involves making sure that those parks are working for us. So thank you all for being here. We are gonna proceed as normal. If, if this is your first time watching or you're regular, first round's a read, second round is watch, third round is listen. And we're gonna get started first with Becky Schneerman, who is the Director of Parks Financial and Support Services Division. And uh, yeah, let's get to your pick. I got you here in the slides. I love the covers of these books. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Janine Frost. I guess she mm -hmm. can be considered um, kind of a, I'm, I'm in the middle of recording. That's okay. I got a, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so, there is, um, sorry, I just got really flustered because there's people telling other people in the building that they're in the waiting room. I'm a, okay. So Janine Frost is a, I am totally losing, losing my uh, mojo here. Janine Frost is um, a romance author, but with a twist, right? Uh, a little bit of, real uh, magical realism and fantasy going on there and we got vampires we got werewolves and some of her stuff um i know becky's a fan of this author we did actually have her visit our libraries a couple years ago and it was really a pleasure to meet her it was cool her fans are really really into the book so i'm excited to hear from becky a little bit about uh why she chose books by janine frost we have them available on all of our branches in every format whether you like listening to your books or actually reading them and take it away becky um, well, I love paranormal romance books. Um, these, this is actually one of my favorite authors. Um, these are two pretty cool books. The first one, Halfway to the Grave, is kind of, is her first book in the Night Huntress series that she has, and it's basically um, about a half vampire, half human who falls in love with this guy, and um, he tries to kill her. And of course, you know, it's a really great love story. Um, and it's it's a really cool book. And then she's got several spinoffs of the series that she has and she's created, um, she has one, the one I, I posted Shades of Wicked is her most recent one with one of the characters that was from the original novel that was kind of a side character. 
And this one is, I think, actually my favorite series. And I even like it better than her original books that she's written because I've started rereading the, the books again. And it's about this like, you know, really cool, you know, vampire bachelor guy um, and this law guardian and they meet and they shouldn't fall in love. And, you know, she's like basically, a, you know, trying to go after this demon and, you know, another paranormal romance love story. So um, I, I really love this, uh, this series and this author. So that is why I picked this, um, this story. Awesome. So you know, let's say I wanted to read one of these books, which would be a big change from my normal reading uh, habits. But I, I, I might want to give it a shot. If I go to one of our libraries, grab one, and wanted to find a nice spot outside to read it, if you have anywhere that you recommend where I can find a nice place to get into one of these books? So since they're, you know, they're paranormal books, you know, I would say something someplace woodsy out in a nice environment. So, you know, I'd probably uh, go to one of our um, nature areas and find a nice bench and sit down. I actually, I like Okahili Nature Center. I like to take my kids over to Okahili Nature Center. So while they're picking up pine cones, you know, if I can uh, score some mommy time, uh, you know, obviously my husband will be watching the kids and, uh, you know, check out one of these books. You know, I also, um, I found, I found um, the Shades of Wicked series on your cloud library app, which is a really cool system. I use it on my Kindle Kindle device. So that's great because I can take it anywhere I go, any one of the parks that I go to, instead of having like a gazillion books, you know, in my mom backpack, which they don't fit, you know, I can just like download them on my fire app or my awesome. fire, fire device. So cool. So you're pretty well versed in our electronic resources. It sounds like um, if you're on the call or watching the recording, you, the word hoopla on the screen or cloud library might mean nothing to you, but those are two of our really great ways of being able to read books on your tablet or listen to them on your phone, read them on your phone. Uh, any of our staff and any of our branches would be more than happy to walk you through how to do that because more and more that's the way that people are consuming books. So I'm glad you brought that up. We'll move on to the second person here, first round. We're still in the read. And what we had here was Debbie Nutt, and she actually wasn't able to join us on the call today. Debbie is an administrative assistant with the Parks and Rec Department. Uh, I am going to do my best to share what she took the time to let us know that she liked to read. Uh, Sue Grafton is a, or was, a extremely popular mystery author. Uh, a is for Alibis, the first book of hers in a, in a long running series that she did when she was still with us on the planet. Uh, that was alphabetized. So I believe she made it up to Y before uh, she passed. There's plenty of books there to read. Get started with A. Uh, and I did talk to Debbie a little bit last week. Um, and I do know that she enjoys reading right in park at uh, John Prince Park at the square, I think Square Lake that's there. Um, she just likes going out and reading uh, in her free time there. So that's another great spot in that park. If you've ever walked around the whole thing, I'm sure there's a lot of little nooks and crannies where you can hide in with a book there. So I want to thank Debbie for uh, letting us know about the book that she likes. And we'll, we'll be uh, continuing with her in the next few rounds, and I'll, I'm going to do my best to represent all the good picks that she has for us. Next in this round, we're going to move on to Jimmy Davis. He's the director of aquatics for the county. Um, this book is one of the better known leadership books that have come out in modern times. And I really like its premise, starting with why. Uh, I'd like to hear more from Jimmy about uh, his, his pick here, maybe what, what the book has taught him about leadership. It is available in all formats as well. So readily available. Why'd you pick this for us today, Jimmy? Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, so, you know, I picked this book. Uh, you know, this, this really had a major impact on me. Um, Simon Sinek, uh, to me is a great inspirational speaker. Uh, and I've watched several, uh, you know, different podcasts that he does and, and TED Talks. And, uh, and he's just really challenged me to look at things differently, both like personally and professionally. So um, this book actually was recommended by Mike Zakis. He was uh, at the NR NRPA conference and, um, and somebody had recommended it to him and, and he shared it with, uh, with me in our division. And and it, and it really, um, 
it kind of changed the way I looked at things. Uh, you know, focusing more on your why, not like how you do stuff and and what you know what to do, um, but why you know wh why you're doing things. Like why are, you know like for our division, um, you know why do we exist? Why what what is our purpose? And and kind of and then not only understanding that from my perspective, but um, helping our you know our staff understand you know what it is that we do and why why we are so important. Um, so. You know, it's really helped me to be a better leader, a better decision maker, um, and I and I highly recommend. Uh, you know, if you, if you haven't had the opportunity to to look him up, he's got tons of stuff on YouTube, uh, or you know, opening up this book. He's I think he's got five books out, um, and he's just uh, he's got a really interesting take on on inspiring people to become better leaders and better people. Sounds awesome. I mean, it sounds like it'd be a really effective way to figure out how to stay focused on what's important and not get caught up in some of the minutia and stuff. Right. Absolutely. Yep. Very cool. And a nice outside spot that you'd recommend sitting down with this. Uh, well, I, I would say uh, Coral Cove is probably my, my favorite, one of my favorite beaches to, to go to. So I would say uh, Coral Cove park up in uh, DeQuesta would be my go-to spot. Very nice. Yeah. I like it up there too. Is that where the, Shakespeare by the sea is near by that or is it what was that I, I missed what was it called you guys have the Shakespeare by the sea up north every year right oh, that's uh, uh more towards um isn't that over towards uh like Carlin Carlin Park? Park? yeah I think okay. that's over by Carlin yeah so it's on the north end of uh, Jupiter Island um Very cool. it's, kind of, it's close to blowing rocks and um just a just a cool cool park nice well thank you for that recommendation Next, we have Donald Campbell. Uh, he recommended a few, a couple books by author David Halberstam, who is a very well-known um, sports kind of focused writer, but I would say like a narrative nonfiction writer. A um, couple books here focusing a little bit on baseball, but I think from talking with Donald, there's a little bit more going on there than that. So uh, take it away, Donald. Tell us a little bit about these books and, and why you think uh, we should read them. Thanks, Chris. Um, these these two books I, I recommended because, first of all, I'm a big sports fan, um, and baseball is my favorite sport. So I'm at, so I was I gravitated towards these two books. Um, but David Halberstam Halberstam himself is a very well known uh, journalist, historian, uh, and author. Um, he won a Pulitzer Prize for his um, covering of the Vietnam War back in the '60s. Um, he he uh, um, was part of the you know covered civil rights. He's uh, covered politics. Um, and later in his career, like you mentioned, he got into sports journalism. And these are two of uh, my favorite books by him. Um, the first one is Summer of 49. Uh, it deals with the uh, pennant race between the New York Yankees, Joe DiMaggio's New York Yankees, and Ted Williams' Boston Red Sox. So probably, in my opinion, the greatest American sports rivalry, um, you know, the original East Coast versus West Coast rivalry, Boston and and uh, um, uh, or actually, you know, up, up, up down the East Coast, Boston and New York. And it takes place towards the end of DiMaggio's career, but right in the middle of Williams's career. Um, and it focuses on um, those two teams where back then in the 19 in 1949 in the American and National League, you had eight teams in each division. You didn't have different divisions where you had wild cards and division winners. It was the best record in each league went to the World Series. Um, and usually in that time, it was the Yankees and the Red Sox that were battling it out. Um, and this book takes you through that time, uh, a few years after World War II, it ended um, right before television hit with baseball. And, um, you know, Ted Williams, who was the last man to hit 400, Joe DiMaggio, who had the 56 game hitting streak two of the legends of the game um, and their teams battling, battling it out to the last game of the season to see who comes out on top. But it's not just going back and learning about uh, the players and, and, you know, their teams, um, but what the times were like back then, the interaction with the public, the interaction with the sports writers. So people that like to go back and, and see maybe how times have changed through the decades. This is a, a good example of what baseball used to be, what maybe Americana used to be back then. The second book, The Teammates, deals with some of those Boston Red Sox teammates. Uh, um, on the cover, Bobby Doerr from left to right, Dominic DiMaggio, uh, Johnny Pesky, who, who the right field foul pole in Boston is named after in Fenway Park, and then Ted Williams on the right. And it talks about 60 years of friendship. The book opens up with 
Dominic DiMaggio and Johnny Pesky traveling 1300 miles uh, in October of 2001 to see their friend Ted Williams who's dying. And, um, you know, Bobby Doerr isn't able to make the trip with them. Um, all these men are in their 80s at the time. Bobby Doerr isn't able to make the trip with them because his wife is ailing and he's not able to make the trip. And it takes you through that friendship, that 60 years of friendship. It also takes you through the upbringing of each one of those, what shaped these individuals, how very different they were from one another, the domineering presence of Ted Williams, who said, God himself, if he came down from the heavens, couldn't get a fastball by me, you know, to, uh, um, you know, someone like Dominic DiMaggio, who was a seven-time All-Star, well, the brother of Joe DiMaggio, um, Bobby Doerr, who, who was probably the even-keeled person uh, that could deal with Williams's, uh, um, his, his changes in his, in his demeanor and things like that. But it really focuses on their friendship. It, sure, it goes into baseball and things like that, but you don't have to be a baseball fan or even a sports fan to appreciate this book. It really shows 60 years of friendship, what it means, you know, what they've gone through as friends um, and the trip that they're willing to make to see their friend at the end. And, uh, um, and to me, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a book that I'll always cherish because it was something that, you know, my dad gave me, you know, several years ago. And on the inside cover, you know, he wrote, um, you know, to my teammate, you know, love daddy. And so that's something that um, is, I've always cherished, but they really are good books. Um, if you're not a sports fan, either one of these are still great, but definitely if you like a good story uh, and something to really connect to the human sp spirit, I would definitely recommend, recommend the teammates. That sounds awesome. I mean, like, uh, I think we briefly touched on it when we met ahead of the, doing the recording here. Um, that sports is kind of a almost a metaphor for bigger things in life. Even if you're not a fan, I think you can get a lot of valuable things out of that. Any World Series predictions for this year? I know we're only about halfway through the season, but <laughs> I'll, I'll stick with the Dodgers again. We'll, we'll say the Dodgers still we'll, until they're beaten. <laughs> cool. Uh, outdoor spot that would be good for for someone to come sit. Get uh, into David Halberstam. For me, uh, I would say. Uh, Riverbend Park up in Jupiter uh, mm -hmm. is a great spot. Um, whether you're off, out in your kayak on the water and just kind of relaxing and laying back and reading the book or find a nice big uh, uh, oak tree to sit under and listen to nature while you're reading one of those books. Very cool. Well, thanks. We'll see you again in the next round. And next we have Jennifer Cirillo, Assistant Director of the Parks and Recreation Department and my friend from the Emergency Operations Center. Um, thank you for being here today, Jennifer. This yeah, book, my pleasure. Thanks. Uh, this book I have never read, but it is definitely like on my list now. I was intrigued by uh, by the title uh, when I read that this was one that you were interested in sharing. Uh, definitely something that's always in my mind, even though I don't have children at the moment. But uh, I'd love to hear from you more about why you picked this today and why why you would love to see more people reading this. Yeah, thanks, Chris. So um, I am a mom of two children. Uh, this book, when I first heard about it, uh, was close to when it came out in 2006. And I first borrowed it from the library and then realized I really needed to have a copy to loan to other people. So uh, I do have a copy actually in my office. It's something that I, um, I look to frequently. And it really coined the term of nature deficit disorder in our children. And so uh, the Boston Globe called it a book that's a must read for parents. And the reason I chose to share it was the author does a really nice job in this book um, referencing, uh, you know, Lakota chiefs and philosophers and, you know, um, naturalists that all kind of got this concept that our connection to nature is so important. And if we don't spend time outdoors, we not only see the mental, but physical, um, physiological differences in our bodies by not spending time outdoors, right? So we're all parks and recreation professionals on this call. So I would encourage people to visit their parks and spend time outdoors, but you can just even go outside your home, uh, spend a little time um, observing nature anywhere that you are. Uh, even if you're waiting in line somewhere at a doctor's office, take a step outside, sit on a bench, spend a little time observing what's around you, listening to the sounds. And the great thing about this body of work is that um, it's growing, right? The research, what we went through this last year and being isolated from each other um, during COVID, 
we have seen in our profession that people value our parks and open and green and blue spaces more than ever before. And they really don't, don't know how to name that, right? Why it's so important and they felt better spending time outside. And, but there's a, there's a growing body of scientific research that supports that. And so I think this is a really good book if you have not looked into, into this issue before and why it's important. You know, the author touches on children and he talks about during the course of writing this book, raising his own son. And by the end of the book, he's going off to college, right? But he, he you know, kept um, collecting this research and why it was so important and then use that as a parent for his child to spend that time outdoors. And so I think it's a really good starting point for people to look into this and then it'll open your eyes to maybe some of this connection and why it's so important to each of us as people that we spend some time outdoors. And um, then you can go from there. And I think you'll continue to find that there's related works, related research that continues to support uh, why it's so important, not just for our own children, but to break down barriers for equity and access for all children to spend some time outside. Wonderful. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think the more and more they start digging and looking at some of this research, you know, we're gonna, the proof's gonna be in the pudding. So uh, hopefully we can, you know, see some shifts and have some dedicated time to just, just being outside. I, it, I find a lot of connection with just the concept of just slowing down and taking a minute to, to breathe and appreciate things too. So um, yeah, I mean, it's probably right up there with some uh, of the benefits that you can get from, from meditating or whatever that they're starting to find out now it's too, a right? Great place to meditate. And we have some meditation videos that will walk you through um, some of our parks and mm -hmm. really you get to spend a little time virtually. So even if you can't, uh, physically get to one of our parts, you can you can experience some of that green space and connection to nature virtually through our PVC Parks um, website as well. Wonderful. Uh, for, for those who can make it outside to one of the spaces, is there one off the top of your head that you'd recommend as a good one to sit? Yeah, so you mentioned we have 104 uh, properties and facilities we manage. I'm not supposed to have favorites, um, but I do. <laughs> Becky, Becky and Donald mentioned a couple of them, but I guess I'll take one that wasn't mentioned yet. So I think you need to, you need to get out into the, the woods. Um, you need to get out into nature. Green K is a very popular um, location, but I think it'd be wonderful to, to take a little hike out on the boardwalk, find yourself um, a good bench to sit and read a little bit about why this is so important as you connect to nature yourself. So I would probably pick, if it's not Riverbend and it's not Okahili, um, I might pick Green K to, to give this a, a read. Very cool. Yeah, Green K is one of my favorites too for the scenery. I saw a couple of gators there recently. I was just telling you. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll let you all know my favorites at the end of the call. I'll, I'll, my top 10, but uh, I'll get that right. Thank you, Jennifer. We'll see you again uh, in the next round. Um, that brings us to the Bottom of the first round here was the last read recommendation, and you might recognize the cover of this book. It's a definitely a, could be considered a classic children's piece of literature. Uh, here with us today from the department is Daniela Robbins. She's a volunteer coordinator with Parks and Recreation, and I'm excited to hear why you decided to share this one with us today, Daniela. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, so I have two little kids. Um, and I don't get to do as much reading uh, as I used to. Um, so I'm choosing a children's book today because um, I read to them. And uh, I chose this one because this is just a fun little read. Um, and it actually, I actually use it as like a transition to get my kids ready to, for bed because <laughs> um, they could stay up all night long. So. Um, but, uh, I, I love, uh, fun little fact about me is I actually have a really like fascination with the moon. I've just always been drawn to it. It's just, um, really fun to look at. Um, it's, I bring my kids outside on full, on, uh, full moons and we howl at the moon. And, um, so the title instantly got me. Um, but, uh, one little, uh, thing about it is, you know, it, um, in the, in the book, um, the character, the, the narrator, they say, they say goodnight to everything. Um, so that's why it's such a great transition for my kids because I'm like, okay, let's say goodnight to the fan. Let's say goodnight to the bed. Let's say goodnight to your teddy bear. So um, 
it's just a fun little read and um, yeah, I can't say anything else about it. Really cool. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I don't know if you've taken this one outside to read with kids or anything, but if you did, you have a spot in mind where you would want to go? Um, yeah, I mean, so we go to uh, my kids. I take them a lot to West Delray Regional Park. There is a really cool RC track there. Um, and so uh, I take them out there and, you know, let them run around and, you know, play around with their RC cars. And it's a, it's a little hidden gem. It's way out west. Very cool. Lots of hidden gems around. So thanks for sharing that one. Hopefully uh, we can make it out there sometime soon. We're going to get started with the second round, but before we get into uh, our watch recommendations here, I, I do know that we've been joined by a, a handful of plus people since we started. Um, some of you might be folks that were directly invited to come in. We did have some technical issues earlier. I think we're starting to work through that and catch our flow here. but. Um, I do want to say if you're on the call, uh, we do want to try to have some interaction. I know we won't be able to hear you through your mic, but I'm also monitoring the chat. So if anything's recommended that you have any questions about or that you have read or watched or heard before that you want to let everyone know anything, feel free to drop something in the chat. Um, I'm watching that as, as closely as I can here. Um, that's the best we can do as far as interacting these days. And um, Speaking of the chat, keep your eye on it. I'm going to drop a, a chance to log in and evaluate what you thought about today. Uh, we'd love to hear your feedback. And um, yeah, we'll get started with the second round here. Watch. So these are going to be TV shows and movies. And we're going to start back with Becky, Becky Schnerman. And um, this might not need too much of an introduction. It was one of the more popular TV shows I think going back to what 2015, 2016, when it first came out, uh, it really got a lot of attention for uh, its sort of retro scenery and, and characters and, and, and settings. Um, it's Stranger Things. We do have seasons one and two on DVD at our branches. Um, sometimes with these newer TV shows, production and stuff, uh, we can only kind of get when they're released. But I do recommend watching the show. I'd love to hear from Becky why she picked it today. So uh, this uh, series actually um, got me through maternity leave with my first child. So, <laughs> um, you know, I'm a workaholic and, uh, you know, it was, it was a little difficult to take, you know, actually it was my first kid. So um, I was afraid to take her anywhere. So um, I stayed in the house and I watched Netflix. Um, and then I watched and then there's, you know, there's lots of movies available on Hoopla and some of the other. Um, and then I would go over to the library because I lived in Palm Beach Gardens at the time, go over to the Gardens Branch Library, and I would check out like DVDs and stuff like that too. But this series, I love it. It's 80s. It's retro. It's super cool. Uh, one of my partners, my uh, co-workers here got me this really cool uh, set. <laughs> um, and mm -hmm. then for uh, my one of my birthdays, I actually have a Lego set of the Stranger Stranger Things that I haven't yet put together. But it's a really really cool series. It's it's very it's interesting. Um, it's you know kind of got like a the upside down all you know alterniverse kind of area. It's got um, science experiments, so it's like a really cool sci-fi retro film. I would say if you like the Goonies, um, you know you. Um, if you've made that like a sci-fi movie more, you know, so than a, than a pirate movie, um, I think you'd really like this series. It's, it's a pretty cool original series that they created. Awesome. I like that. Very cool. And we also have it on Blu-ray too. And um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it too. I didn't, I haven't gotten around to watching the third season yet, but uh, there's just so much to watch, which I think is a good reason to get people together and recommend things. So some, sometimes waiting through everything out there uh, can be a little overwhelming for me at least. So thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Next, we've got Debbie Nutt's recommendation. And if, uh, if you've joined us since the first round, I'll let everyone know again, uh, Debbie wasn't able to join us in person today, uh, but I'm going to do my best to share her recommendations on her behalf as she put some effort into letting us know uh, what she's been enjoying. Um, we went with this television show called Yellowstone. That's a good connection to the park there. 
Uh, you, you might have heard of the heard of that park before. Um, but I was really taken aback by the fact that I had no idea that Kevin Costner was on a three season run of a network television show. So that shows you how in tune I am with popular culture sometimes. Uh, but this is uh, what sounds like a fascinating show. I still haven't gone around to watch it, but it really gets into um, sort of land rights. It really goes back to and 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 sort of kind of like this the social dynamics that get built when you have indigenous populations. And uh, Kevin Costner, if I'm understanding correctly, was uh, part of a family who's owned the land for generations. And there's you know a little bit of conflict there between two converging interests. Um, I'm sure there's a love story in there somewhere too. I haven't watched the show, but uh, Debbie recommends it wholeheartedly. Uh, I know when I let my mom know that uh, Kevin Costner was on TV, she didn't know either and she's excited. So someone out there has got to be excited that Kevin Costner's on TV besides me and my mom. Um, I definitely recommend getting it. We do have all three seasons on DVD at our branches. So I won't talk too much more for Debbie there, but uh, Debbie, thank you for lending your recommendation. And that brings us back to Jimmy Davis here with the, another show that really blew a lot of people's minds, including mine, uh, Peaky <laughs> Blinders. And we have physical copies of the branch at the branches for this one too. So definitely check them out. And Jimmy, uh, what is it about the show that made you want us to hear about it today? Um, well, Peaky Blinders is a, uh, is a great series. Uh, it takes place in the early 1900s. Um, it's kind of a lower, in uh, lower class uh, society kind of joining uh, the ranks here, forming um, the gang. Uh, and uh, they pretty much they wreak havoc on, on, um, on England um, and you know, through various illegal activities, of course, and, uh, and some political influence. Um, the show, like, you know, some, some shows are kind of predictable and stuff. I would, I really feel like this one was, was unpredictable a lot of times and had a lot of pretty cool twists and, and, and really kept me guessing what was coming up. Um, so there's a lot of great characters in it, but for me, uh, Tom Hardy, he plays Alfie uh, and who's the leader of like the Jewish gang, uh, kind of a rival slash partner. Uh, and there's a lot of back and forth and some parodies and different things. And, and he just crushes that character. And um, it's just a really entertaining show. Kind of get your mind off of reality, all those good things. And I definitely, if you haven't seen it, uh, highly recommend it. So, Yeah, very cool. And, uh, you know, a little secret about me is I, I'm definitely harboring a, a man crush on Tom Hardy. And I've said more than one time on occasion that I could watch him on mute. <laughs> he's uh, he's just good on screen i really i really do like him well don't uh, don't watch him don't you gotta you gotta have the volume on for peaky blinders the, yes, the yes. Accents, <laughs> everything else it's 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 really good so he, he does That's a good great. job it's, a, it's an awesome show i mean even just all the just the the, the period costume and settings and stuff it's cool yeah and i think sure. i think i i really wanted to get a new haircut after i saw this one you know it's like <laughs> that kind of thing well thank you jimmy yep and next, we have another great television show a little, from a little bit of a different era of TV, but I'm, I was excited to see this. Uh, we're back on Donald Campbell here, uh, Recreation Program Supervisor. Uh, Columbo, tell us about it. So um, Columbo is, the, is a detective show. It takes place in uh, Los Angeles, California. Um, the show itself uh, stars Peter Falk. Um, who is a who's a well-known uh, actor uh, throughout the you know 60s, 70s, 80s, and probably is best known to uh, a younger generation of moviegoers by playing Fred Savage's grandfather in The Princess Bride, uh, the one that was telling, reading the book to him, talking about you know uh, true love. So um, Columbo is a, is a is a just from the picture you can tell he's got a cigar in his hand, he's got a rumpled. Uh, raincoat. Uh, he's 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 almost buffoonish in the way that he goes about his uh, 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 his 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 work, uh, but he is one intelligent guy. And something that's really unique about this particular series or or this detective, um, the show itself, is that most 
detective or who uh, most mysteries um, are whodunits, and and you have to find you have to wait till the end uh for to, to find out who the person was that committed the crime you know uh agatha christie's miss marple or akira poirot they all at the very end you find out how it was done and who did it uh this one is uh, is what's called probably more of an inverted uh detective show uh it's it's the uh how are you going to catch them because in the beginning of this show every every episode um you see who's doing it and you see how they're doing it and you see what they're you know who they're who they're you know the crime that they're committing which is murder in this in this particular series and then the rest of the show is how's colombo going to get him you know you, we know who it is he has a pretty good idea who it is and it's really how is he going to get him and it's just you know it's it this took place from the early 70s uh really through 71 until 78 on nbc and then it started running again in the 80s and went through the early 2000s on abc and stuff but it was really part of the the mystery movie of the of the week and stuff and this particular series rotated with dennis weaver's mcleod with um, rock hudson and susan st james mcmillan and wife and stuff as you went through but um stars such as johnny cash um uh jamie lee curtis robert vaughn um, were, were on the show. Uh, uh, Kim Cattrall, a young Kim Cattrall back in the mid 70s was, was on the show. So a, a lot of famous stars of the time uh, or even pre, predating that almost like a, um, let's say like a, 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 a love boat was, right? Where some of the stars were starting out in, in movies or, or pictures and they would make their appearances on here and some of them were older stars. But it really is um, intriguing. It deals more with the well-known uh, people that are the criminals playing the criminals in this series, uh, whether they're whether they're wealthy, whether they're a movie star, whether they're a country singer like Johnny Cash was in the in one of the episodes. Um, but it's it's really intriguing. He's got a lot of quirks, a lot of mannerisms. He asks a million questions that these people don't take him seriously at first, and by the end they're like fed up with him. You know, get to the point, Columbo. What's this? And he's always this. You know, his famous line is as he's walking out the door, as he turns around, he goes, "Just one more thing," you know, when he reaches up and you know, or just one more question. Question. and uh, um and it's and it's really good i would recommend it to anyone just to uh, um to watch but again the thing that makes it really interesting is most most detective shows you're trying to figure out who did it this one you know from the from the from the onset who did it and now the, the rest of the story is the rest of the show is how's he going to get them and uh, um yeah so i definitely would highly recommend it yeah very cool i've always enjoyed the show too i don't know if i've had as thorough of a watching ex experience as you have, but uh, I, I would say it's like really good for anybody who is really into watching these procedural things on now that, and kind of see the roots of these sort of quirky right. investigators, right? Yeah, um, like, like, like you look at clean cut detectives today, like any of the law and orders or any of the CSIs or things like that, and they're buttoned down and they're, they're to the point and, and, and just very, you know, due diligence where, where this guy is like fumbling around it's whether it's intentional or not you, you're like how can this guy catch somebody that's you know but he is he's a genius you know he's, he's yeah <laughs> yeah he's pretty cool uh we do have all seven seasons on dvd at our branches and we do have two of the mo mystery movie collections which is all of them uh over a two disc set so there's volume one and volume two and those are just all the mini made for tv movies that that you mentioned so thank you for mentioning those uh, so yeah, you could stay pretty busy with Columbo for a little bit if you visit one of our branches and just kind of hoard it all and go home and uh, that'll be a long-term binge. But uh, thank you for all that, Donald. Very cool. We're going to move on to Jennifer Cirillo with a really cool movie here, really long form uh, animated film that's basically a, a staple for anybody who uh, is into... I guess, Japanese animation. Um, I'm not even very deeply into it, but I'm familiar with this one. Uh, we won't talk about the live action film that came out a couple of years ago, but that, that does count. Uh, Jennifer, tell us about this. Yeah, so this title, there's a lot of options, right? Um, when you look it up uh, to view, but the one I'm recommending is the 1995 uh, classic, Ghost in the Shell, um, directed by Mamura Oshi. And um, it's classic Japanese cyber, cyberpunk anime. Um, it, I mentioned I have kids, they're now 20 and 21. So one of the things my son and I actually connect on, he loves watching anime and watching, you know, people playing on Twitch and all sorts of things, um, esports. And so something we can connect on is anime, but 
the reason I specifically recommended this one is a few years ago, one of our parks, more Kami Museum and Japanese Garden, um, had an exhibit. So if you're not familiar with that park in the museum, um, South Florida has a connection, specifically Western Delray Beach has a connection to, um, to Japanese heritage and culture of a farming community that was there. And so uh, the Yamato farming colony. Um, so a few years ago, they had this exhibit and it was anime architecture and they were featuring uh, this um, piece and really focusing on the architecture in it, right? And I was familiar with it, but I never really noticed that that was such a progressive and cool thing. So I went back and rewatched it and it is for mature audiences, just like Yellowstone and Peaky Blinders. You know, this is a very mature anime. Um, so keep that in mind uh, as you as you look into it, if you're not familiar with it, or even go back and rewatch it and look at the architecture, the design of the waterways and the buildings and the signage and the vehicles. You know, it was really progressive at the time and so much of the anime that we're watching today built upon um, what they did then. And it was really incredible to think about now. I don't want to say how long ago 95 was, it was a long time ago. But to think about um, how progressive that was at the time, and so it's really cool just to, um, you know, and and that we have that connection here in Palm Beach County to, to this art form, and I think we can celebrate it and educate ourselves and others about our connection to it. So I highly recommend it. Very cool. Yeah. No, I can't wait to rewatch it and sort of be looking for the architecture stuff. Uh, I really think that's a, a neat thing to be paying attention to. Uh, and the Murakami in general, it's, I'm glad that it came up because that's just one of many things that, uh, you know, if you aren't really thinking about county government like we are when you're going around, you know, you might not even realize that that's a, a county park and recreation facility. So, yeah, um, and I heard wonderful things about their current exhibit. They have rotation. Uh, some of their museum exhibits rotate. And so if you haven't been there lately as well, check it out. It's it's open again. And uh, they, they have a new exhibit there that is um, supposedly really, really good. Cool. Well, thank you. We're going to move on to the last section here of the watch. I'm sure you recognize some of these covers. We're going to be back to Daniela, who uh, selected a, a few Marvel movies. Um, and like most people, I like Marvel too. But uh, you may or may not know that we do have most of this stuff available at our branches. And I want to talk to Danielle a little bit more about why she picked these and Marvel in general, really. What's up, Daniela? Yeah, so I'm actually like currently watching all the movies, um, like in timeline order. Um, actually, no, I just finished timeline order. I'm going to watch them <laughs> again, um, like in the phases. So. Uh, Marvel has, you know, created all these movies and they have like a phase one and a phase two, three and four. Um, and I, I just picked these movies. Um, they stand out to me. Um, first of all, uh, Captain America, the first Avenger is pretty much like where the whole story begins. Uh, you get like the backstories on all the other characters, uh, origin stories. Um, and Captain America is just a really good, like, wholesome character. So, um, you know, it's fun for my, for my kids to watch as well. Um, Avengers Age of Ultron is a, as a, uh, I think it's the second movie, the second Avengers movie. Um, and a couple of additional characters are introduced in the movie. I think Wanda and Vision. And um, it's just a really, really cool, fun story. It's, if you like superhero movies, um, and action, you know, Marvel is, uh, you know, all these movies are just are, are really good, really well done. They're not corny or, or anything like that. Um, and then Thor Ragnarok, um, Chris Hemsworth is just really great to look at. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's very good looking and he's really funny. Um, you know, he's very versatile and um, I just love this movie and um uh, his relationship and his interactions with the Hulk. They have a really funny um, uh, friendship and, and relationship and uh, just their interactions in this in Thor Ragnarok are, are just um, are funny. It's, it's a silly movie. Yeah, the, yeah, the Thor ones are, are some of my favorites. And 
Chris Hemsworth is no Tom Hardy, but he's close for sure. Yeah. He's <laughs> <very nice>. uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, have you had a chance to catch Black Widow yet? I have not. Um, I, I I'm waiting for it to like because I have um, I have Disney Plus, mm -hmm. um, and it's like you, you have to pay yeah, fee to thirty to bucks. Watch it. Yeah. So, um, but I think it, it's um, uh, sometime in September, maybe November. I'm not sure. Um, they'll that fee will will come off. So I'm gonna wait. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a, a wise decision. You got plenty of movies to get through leading up to that too. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Well, cool. That brings us to our third and final round, which is listen. Uh, this is going to be all music recommendations. If if you're just joining us or just scrolling through the recording, we are here with the Parks and Rec staff, who we let have do a special Parks and Rec takeover here for Read, Watch, Listen this month. It is Park and Rec month every July, so we're celebrating with them. And uh, I do encourage everyone to celebrate by spending some time outside at one of our parks. Uh, we will get started with the listen round though. I know we're getting close to time. So we're back to Becky and she's recommending a little known artist by the name of Lady Gaga. Uh, I wanna learn a little bit more about Lady Gaga myself, Becky, but I, I just wanna let everyone know that basically every one of Lady Gaga's st uh, major studio releases is available physically and through Hoopla. So if you're a fan or are gonna become one after you listen to Becky's recommendation, it's easy to access, free of charge with your library card. What's up, Becky? What, tell I, us a little bit more about Lady Gaga. I love Lady Gaga. Like you, you said you have a man crush on Tom Hardy. I have a lady crush, I guess, on Lady Gaga. I just, I think she's <laughs> fabulous. I just, she's just a, an incredible artist. She's a great actress. Um, and I love her music. And I like that she writes her own music, which I think is, is different. Um, some, and she actually wrote, wrote music for other artists. It was interesting when I, was researching just kind of how she started started up when I started listening to um, her first album, which is I think the Fame. Um, she tried to get into the industry, couldn't because they said she just wasn't good enough and wrote music for some other famous artists, and then just broke out, you know, with with this album, um, and just you know hasn't stopped. You know, you know, of course I love horror movies and stuff, and she was on American Horror Story. Um, uh, you know, as a vampire, which, you know, ties into my paranormal romance stuff, but, um, you know, so she's like, you know, she's, she's really cool, but when, um, um, pre-kids, I used to like to take a lot of walks, but, uh, by myself, um, and I would listen to her music, uh, just on my exercise walk, um, and then what was really cool was your, um, Hoopla app, and then your Freegal app that you have, because I didn't have access to any of the stuff, um, you know, I wasn't subscribing to like Spotify or anything. So the fact that you have like all of our albums was really cool because I could just load it up on my phone and then just listen through them. And then you can set up like a mix of, of stuff too. And one of the albums that people haven't listened to, she's got an album with um, uh, Tony Bennett, uh, Cheek to Cheek. Mm -hmm. And it's really good. Um, she does jazz. So she does different types of styles of, of music. Um, she actually did, I think it was, I can't remember if it was the Oscars or what event she did. She actually sung um, a song from The Sound of Music, um, I thought, with um, when she was a Julie Andrews song. And she just, she just, I just absolutely love her. I just think she's a beautiful singer. So if uh, I would recommend any one of her, her albums to anybody. Very cool. And like I said, we have basically all, all of her major studio recordings. And once you get into Freegal, as you mentioned, or Hoopla, you know, some uh, kind of unofficial releases will pop up and remixes and stuff too. So you can do a deep uh, Lady Gaga dive and a lot of our electronic resources. Thank you, Becky. Brings us back to Debbie, who uh, I will be sharing on her behalf, as I mentioned. Uh, she recommended Chris Stapleton, who is a singer songwriter uh, with a pretty uh, well established career. This album, Traveler is uh, what I'm understanding is his debut. Uh, I did get to talk to Debbie a little bit about, um, you know, kind of if there's a standout track or anything on here that she would recommend if, if you only had time to listen to one. Uh, I believe it was called Tennessee Whiskey. So that's one you could look up. Uh, we do have the CD at uh, Branches you can put on hold uh, and you can also find the entire album on Hoopla. 
So hey Chris, real quick about Chris Stapleton, if I could add sure, something. Yeah, yeah, please. One of the stories in. I love about him, and I've shared this um, in some of my uh, leadership meetings, is that uh, he keeps in his medicine cabinet his old name tag when he worked at Papa John's Pizza. And so just to remember, you know, to stay humble and remember his roots and how far he's come toward his dreams. So I think that's a pretty cool thing about him. Wow, that is really cool. Thanks for sharing that. I love that. I should find uh, some of my old name tags around somewhere. <laughs> Very cool. Well, thanks, Jennifer and Debbie. Next, we've got Jimmy Davis recommending the one and only Bob Marley. Uh, whether or not you're familiar with with him, there's always a lot of songs I think that he's done that people might not have gone around to hear. Um, and a lot like Lady Gaga, we really do have almost his entire recorded catalog available uh, physically and digitally. So uh, Jimmy's on the call with us. What is it about Bob Marley that made you want to want to share with us today, Jimmy? I think the question is what what's not to like about Bob Marley. I think that's the right, yeah. the right answer to that. Um, you know, uh, I just, I'm a huge reggae fan, uh, kind of like, you know, I, I'm listening to Slightly Stupid a lot and Dirty Heads and, and Bob Marley. It's, uh, it's something that I just, I really, it's, it's like positive, uh, uh you know, feel good music. It's kind of laid back. Um, it always, uh, you know, kind of puts you in a good mood. Um, you know, it always takes me back watching that, that, um, Will Smith movie when he's like the only guy alive. He's got the the Bob Marley tunes, and I, I just relate with that, you know. Just um, so, um, and you know, it's something also with like I got I got three kids, and and you know, it, it's something they enjoy listening to. It's something you know that we all can you know listen to, and it and um, you know, so yeah, that's that's why I picked Bob Marley. Um, I you know we you had talked a little bit before about picking, you know, favorite songs and, and mm -hmm. it, you know, it's hard to pick, you know, one. So I picked three, three of them, the three little birds, no women, no cry and, and one love, uh, you know, for, for my favorite songs from him. So all really good ones too. <laughs> he's a, he's a really amazing person. I, I, I learned so much about him in that documentary that was released by him in, the, in recent years that, you know, just a little bit more about his actual influence on on politics in Jamaica and and, and some of his social um, contributions. Uh, you know, I think a lot of that gets overlooked sometimes because the songs are so good. But uh, it was definitely like an inspiring documentary. If anyone uh, is looking for for a good uh, biographical educational experience, <laughs> thank you, Jimmy. Yep. Back to Donald. And you might recognize that eh, he might be better than Tom Hardy, honestly, on the screen. Uh, this is Elvis Presley. Uh, you might recognize him. Uh, we do have a lot of different ways of accessing basically every song that Elvis um, has created, mostly in the form of kind of greatest hits collections, though. Uh, so there's all sorts of different formatted ones if you browse Hoopla or Freegal and things like that. Um, and we do have uh, 50 greatest hits, 30 number one hits uh, on the physical CD too. So we do have Donald, if you want to come hop back on here, Donald, and let us know a little bit about the King, uh, why you decided to share him with us today. We might have some people that have never even heard him on here. How are you? Sure. Thanks again, Chris. So I, since everyone's, or most people are admitting to their crushes, I would say that I have a man crush on Elvis. So I'm, I'm, I've, I've loved his music ever since I was a little kid. Uh, the songs like, you know, Hound Dog and Jailhouse Rock, where it's just upbeat, get up and move music uh, is what attracted me to him initially. Um, I probably wouldn't have known, uh, you know, some of the more uh, um, relevant songs that he sang as far as, uh, um, as he got older in life. When I was that young, it probably wouldn't have mattered to me. It was probably just the upbeat music. Um, but the more that I listened to him, the more I wanted to learn about him, uh, learned about his humble beginnings, uh, where he came from, uh, um, what, what he, where he and his parents came from and what he went through. Um, and, you know, he's the only member, he's the only musician that has been inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and the Gospel Hall of Fame. So that should tell you across genres uh, of music what, what his influence has been. Um, and even if some of the songs as people will, will 
always point out they, they weren't Elvis's songs. They were somebody else's songs. He brought awareness to those songs. And by bringing awareness to those songs, he brought a, uh, awareness to the artists that sang those songs. And, you know, little Richard said, you know, he was really, you know, upset the first time he heard Elvis, you know, like doing Tutti Frutti and stuff like that. But then he realized that Elvis singing his song brought more attention to him brought more attention to his music. So more people uh, had an avenue to find out about Little Richard. And that's the same thing, uh, you know, that he did with any of those songs, whether they were uh, rhythm and blues songs, uh, gospel, rock and roll. Um, and, you know, if I had to, you know, recommend um, a, a couple of songs, one I would say would be If I Can Dream. Um, and this was part of his 1968 comeback special, where this was, I believe, the only time that he sang the song. It was something that he was advised not to sing. Um, it was right on the heels of Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr. being assassinated uh, in April for Martin Luther King Jr. and June of 68 for uh, Bobby Kennedy. Um, and if you haven't heard that song and you know the context of what's, what that song surrounds and the times that were going on back then, listen to it and it'll, it'll bring you to your knees. It's, it's emotional, uh, the message that he has in it. And, uh, um, you know, the one thing uh, about Elvis was, you know, regardless of, you know, his looks or, or whatever people may say is he always had that voice. And I think he had a two octave and sometimes even into a three octave voice. So for people that think it was all about looks, listen to, if you, if I can dream and hear the vocal range that he has in that, um, you know, watch him do suspicious mind, you know, when he's, you know, gyrating, you know, I mean, this is someone that was coming through social times that Ed Sullivan filmed him from the waist up, you know, they wouldn't let him film him from the waist down, you know, Elvis to pelvis is what they called him and, uh, you know, in, in the gyrations and how they called it devil music, you know, when he was, you know, doing that. So he was dealing with a lot of, um, prejudices and things back in his time when he was coming up uh and he and he persevered through that um and again his music has a huge range of of not just genres but but in the musical type and so whether what, whatever mood you're in um some people may go to different artists or different songs from different artists but i think you could look anywhere in elvis's catalog and find a song that probably fits the mood that, that you're feeling at that moment and uh if you've never listened to him i would definitely recommend it and uh, um yeah. Awesome. You, you heard it here on Read, Watch, Listen that Elvis is not just a pretty face. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> no, very cool. And I, I haven't heard that. For, uh, if, if I could dream, you said? Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make sure to listen to that. Powerful. I'm a, a suspicious minds guy myself. So that's another great one. I know that one gets me moving. No one has to see that, though. <laughs> um, we'll move on to Jennifer Cirillo again. Thank you, Donald. And this looks like a fun one, right? We've got Rob Bass and DJ Easy Rock's album, It Takes Two, featuring a few songs that you'd probably recognize by ear, even if you don't by name. So what I did here was drop a little audio sample here, just so everyone can kind of get themselves ready. Oh, yeah. All right. So. Thanks, Chris. Can... Now I feel pumped up. <laughs> no, yeah, now we're all pumped up. <laughs> wait until the end. Make sure we're all awake. Um, I know you mentioned that this was something that you enjoyed jumping rope to. Uh, I just want to hear hear about that a little bit and and kind of and what what it is about the sound that really uh, that that speaks to you. Yeah, so like many of us that end up in the profession of parks and recreation, I'm a parks and rec kid, right? I grew up, I played a lot of basketball growing up. Um, they say we resonate with music that we were surrounded by when we were like in high school and as a young adult, right? So I am, I'm sorry to say though, I looked up, this is their first studio album. I looked it up uh, just to make sure like I, under, I understood all the tracks that were on it again and remembered it like I did and I did but it's called the golden era now of hip hop. And I was like, oh, I got arrow to the heart, right? That that's the genre now. It's the golden era of hip hop. But um, the reason I recommended this album, and you are probably familiar with the title track, even if you didn't know it was them, um, if it takes two, and it was kind of reinvigorated in that movie, The Proposal, you know, and they were singing it together, that type of thing. But there's a number of tracks on this album. And the way I described it to Chris was hands down, undefeated best album to jump rope to 
because I was conditioning for basketball a lot. So we'd put it on a boom box. And when I think about growing up in the park and I think about being at the basketball court, this is the album that comes to me, you know? So this is, it's close to my heart. And I think what is really misunderstood a little bit or maybe not recognized as much about this album if you listen to the tracks, they have not just It Takes Two, but Joy and Pain, which is a mashup of gospel music uh, with hip hop. They have Get, Get on the Dance Floor, which is electronica mashed up with um, hip hop. And they really are, you know, their artistry is pretty astounding. And this was their debut uh, as a studio album. So it's it's really amazing. And I think I'm still astounded by, you know, all the time, the, the young people and I'm introduced to their music and I'm just like, whoa, what is this, you know? And so at the time when this came out, I think it was 1988, it was like, whoa, what is this, <laughs> you know? And so I think I, I still, it brings back good memories and it just makes you feel good. And this is something that if you, even if you're cleaning your house, it has a really good pulse to it that'll get you moving and get you through whatever you're going through. Awesome. Yeah, I can't imagine that song coming on and not feeling good personally. So <laughs> thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> that brings us to our final Sadly, final recommendation of this final round brought to uh, Daniela Robbins here. Uh, she's recommending Dead Mouse. That's how that's pronounced if I'm informed enough. Uh, this is an electronic musician. I, I know that can mean a lot of things and it might not be the most familiar genre and even the artists uh, themselves is sort of shrouded in, in, in mystery. So um, maybe here to explain a little bit about Dead Mouse to us and, and, and what it is, uh, you know, how we might be able to get into them as listeners uh, is Danielle. What's up, Danielle? Well, I'd like to first say that I like all genres of music, um, mm -hmm. but I think generally I'm, I just kind of gravitate towards dance music or mm -hmm. um, electronic or house music. Um, I grew up uh, listening to disco music. My mom just played disco music all the time. So uh, just anything with like a really fast, repetitive beat, <laughs> um, I just I just gravitate towards. So Dead Mouse is um, it's actually a, I think he's Canadian. Uh, he is a producer. He mostly produces like uh, house music, which you can kind of um, I guess to explain house music, it's like a, a fast, just repetitive uh, uh, beat. Um, and I think it kind of got its origins from disco. Um, so, you know, it's just a really great, uh, Dead Mouse is really great to listen to, like if you're wanting to work out. Um, I usually ride my bike listening to Dead Mouse. Um, even if like, you know, I'm taking a long drive and just kind of zoning out, I, I, he's got some songs that um, it's not like all fast uh, uh, beats, it's just, relaxing music. Um, so he, he's really fun to listen to. Um, there's just so many songs, um, but I would say probably like uh, my top two would be like Strobe and uh, he's got another song I remember. Uh, it's pretty good. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. And much like uh, Lady Gaga and Bob Marley, who we've already gone through, um, we've got a lot of Dead Mouse albums available, uh, whether physically or digitally. We've got four times four equals 12. We got one, one that he's called random album title. Um, we've got one that's called album title goes here. We got one for lack of a better name. So I see a theme. <laughs> yeah. uh, I like it. There's a lot of weird uh, named albums. Yeah. 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 Very cool. And uh, for anyone that might have seen the visual before, it's, it's literally someone at a DJ booth with a huge mouse head on. So that's dead mouse. Um, I, I think we should all dance a little bit more. So I put it on, dance. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you. And, and thank you everyone from Parks and Rec that's on the call today. Um, happy Parks and Rec month to you all. I know you guys work day in and day out to make sure that basically we're all having a good time out there. Um, and I also wanna thank everyone who's on the call watching and who's watching the recording. We had some technical difficulties, so I do apologize for that. Before we go, I do wanna pass it off to Jennifer Cirillo again to close things out and just kind of let us know maybe what's going on with the parks this month and, and some things that we might be able to look forward to in the future. And then everyone else enjoy the rest of your day after that. Thank you, Jennifer.
Thanks, Chris. Um, so again, check us out, pbcparks.com. Uh, we have lots of great stuff happening in our park system. Summer is, summer is a very busy time, as you can imagine, in South Florida for us. Um, we have a lot of rain, the grass is growing, we're keeping the parks well maintained, we have uh, summer camps and tourists and people all over the place, but we have um, a beautiful park system, uh, more than 8,300 park uh, acres to visit, and so we encourage everybody to uh, get connected with us and to discover new things, and I want to thank Palm Beach County Library System, you're a wonderful partner of ours year round, and so this theme this year is the story of parks and recreation. So thank you, Chris, for allowing us to spend a little time telling our story, because a lot of people say, oh, you're like the TV show, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, not exactly. We have so many professionals working very hard to make sure that our communities um, are healthy and happy. Our environment is protected. We have access to beaches um, and water bodies and our youth are supported. We had opportunities for adults to, to recreate. So we have an amazing team. Uh, the Friday, the 17th is actually, um, well, what's today? Wednesday. No, it's the 16th. It's this Friday is uh, Parks and Recreation Professionals Day for 2021. So happy early Parks and Rec Professionals Day to everybody that shared on this call and to our amazing team in PBC Parks and all our municipal Parks and Rec departments here that um, perform this outstanding work as well. And I think one thing looking forward, like when we look forward to parks, I talked a little bit about how in this year of COVID, everybody is appreciating parks very much more. You may have seen some of our national parks, the visitations kind of through the roof. Uh, so we wanna you know, encourage people to engage with our parks, but do it responsibly. There's a number of opportunities and Daniela who's on with us today is actually our volunteer coordinator. And so we have a number of beach cleanups to help give back uh, to our parks in a meaningful way. And, you know, breaking down barriers um, to access to our parks is very important to us and we continue to do that. We're very fortunate in our community that we're free and affordable in most cases, but one of the books we didn't um, mention is The Sum of Us by Heather McGee. And so if you want to look into a little bit about why environmental equity and park equity is so important, I encourage you to check that book out as well. I'm currently listening to that on Cloud Library. So when I walk uh, in the park or around my neighborhood, that's what I'm listening to is the sum of us. So thanks again, Chris, for allowing us to join you today. Thanks to our team for sharing. Uh, there's, some, there's some cool stuff that I'm going to check out or rewatch, reread. Um, and you guys have inspired me today as well. And we really appreciate it. Yes, for real, I'll second that. Seriously, so many good recommendations and thank you for working with me to, to make this happen. Couldn't have done it without you guys. And enjoy the rest of your day. We definitely, when we did, we have some of us, the book that Jennifer just mentioned readily available as well. Um, I have a list of everything that was recommended today that will be published on our website along with the recording. So anything mentioned, uh, you could easily find on that list. If you could always email me, I'm Chris Jankow, and I'll be glad to help you get any of these items. Everyone else, uh, have a great day. It was, it's a pleasure. We'll see you next month, second Wednesday, 2.30. Bye now.